uh, will conclude our reading of Matthew's Gospel by focusing on the very end of his Gospel, which is known as the Great Commission. Uh, in this section, we'll hear how um, Jesus, after Easter and his resurrection, basically entrusts his message to his disciples and consequently to us to be the people who continue to carry out his message of love and peace and mercy and justice for the world. And um, a couple things that are really important about this passage. One is that it's a wonderful bookend uh, for the Gospel of Matthew. You may remember way back at Christmas when we heard the beginning, Matthew's Gospel started with a genealogy that traced Jesus' roots all the way back to Abraham. And then in that very first chapter of Matthew, we heard that Jesus is our Emmanuel, our God with us. And Matthew now closes his Gospel with the words Jesus giving to his disciples of, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And a reminder that even as we're sent into our future, uh, that Jesus and Jesus' Spirit is always with us, uh, guiding us and uh, carrying us and helping us carry the message forward. Uh, part of our role in carrying Jesus' message of justice and peace is certainly justice for our earth and care for our planet. And that's what we're going to be hearing about today. Uh, as many of you know, we are in dire straits right now with our climate, with climate change, with uh, on the brink of cataclysmic natural disasters. We've already seen some of those happening. Um, migration, forced migration that will be happening because of the climate. And sometimes it feels so overwhelming. Uh, but there is still time to change our behaviors and change our actions and care for our Earth. And we're going to hear about that today. And in particular, we're going to hear about uh, one piece of our ecosystem, the pollinators, the bees, that are just so crucial to the health of our planet. And as we'll hear in our passage uh, from Job as well, all of creation, including the bees and the pollinators, are imbued with God's spirit, are part of God's uh, beloved creation. So let us listen for the word of God. Of the Hebrew Testament, Job chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. But as the animals, and they will teach you, the birds of the air, and they will tell you, as the plants of the earth, and they will teach you, and the fish of the sea will declare to you, who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? In God's hand, is the life of every living human thing and the breath of every human being. From Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, and some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of God, the Father, Mother, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. The word of God for the people of God. Today we are celebrating Earth Day. Uh, last Monday was the 49th Earth Day since it began, April 22nd, 1970. Um, it was influenced by Rachel Carson's book, Silent, Silent Spring, that came out in 1962. Where that book raised public awareness and concern for living organisms, the environment, and links between pollution and public health. Can everyone see the slideshow? Um, it was also influenced by the 1969 massive oil spill in Santa Barbara, California. That first Earth Day, over 20 million Americans took to rallies and protests 
about what was happening to our environment. By the end of that year, the United States Environmental Protection Agency was created, and the Clean Air, Clean Water, and Endangered Species Acts were passed. So in keeping with that today, we are celebrating our pollinators. <coughs> Maybe. <laughs> there we go. Can you move it over a little bit? Okay. Do pollinators matter? Yes. One in three bites of every meal is a product of pollination. A pollinator is an animal that causes plants to make fruit or seeds. They do this by moving pollen from one part of the plant to another. Only fertilized plants can make fruit or seeds, and without them, the plants cannot reproduce. There are 369,000 flowering plant species, and 90% are dependent on insect pollination. Apples, mangoes, kiwi, plums, peaches, nectarines, guava, pears, alfalfa, strawberries, onions, cashew, apricots, avocados, green beans, cherries, celery, coffee, walnuts, cotton, flax, lemons, limes, carrots, cucumber, hazelnut, cantaloupe, watermelon, coconut, boysenberries, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, peppers, papaya, raspberries, blackberries, vanilla, cranberries, tomatoes, and grapes are some of the plants that need pollinators. are a major part of the diet of many birds and many mammals, including grizzly bears. Bees are a keystone species, with other species dependent on them to survive. Other animals depend on bees for their survival because their food source, including nuts, berries, and seeds, fruits, rely on insect pollination. Pollination also allows floral growth, which provides habitats for animals, including other insects and birds. There are approximately 200,000 different species of animals around the world that act as pollinators. Of these, about 1,000 are vertebrates, such as birds, bats, and small mammals, such as monkeys, lemurs, possums, rodents, and some lizards even pollinate certain plants. But insects, bees, wasps, moths, butterflies, flies, beetles, are the most common pollinators. see there. Uh, bees are the best. Bees are the most efficient pollinators because they purposely collect pollen for their offspring and in doing so they uh, carry it from plant to plant. Other pollinators move pollen by accident while consuming nectar uh, or other parts of the plant. Uh, bees however are very docile and uh, sometimes they get a bad rap because they get, they're like their, their cousins, the yellow jackets, but these bees are very, very docile. Bee diversity. There are 3,600 species of bees in the United States and Canada. They range in size from uh, very small to a little bit larger. Many have hairy, and some are smooth and come in colors from black to metallic green. 
Um, I don't know how many you have in your neighborhood. I don't know how many I have in my neighborhood. I'll have to count them. Um, these are vegetarians. Unlike their cousins, the wasps and the yellow jackets who will eat a hot dog right out of your mouth if you let them. <laughs> these only uh, eat vegetarian things. And um, they not all live in groups, which is interesting. The honeybee. Uh, the honeybee uh, are often what we think of when we imagine bees. And of course, they, uh, their honey is so uh, enjoyed. They, however, are not native to the US, and they were brought over to Europe in the six, from Europe in the 1600s. They are important for agriculture, uh, but they can compete with native species. Uh, bees live in colonies of about 25,000, and of course, like I said, they are prized for their honey. They are the number one honey makers. Now, the bumblebee, this is my favorite bee. There are only 20 different species of bumblebees, and their colonies are a lot smaller. Uh, they're 300 to 400, in a colony, they're in a uh, colony, and they're not very aggressive at all. In fact, males don't even have stingers. A female can't sting you. Uh, I remember the song that my girls used to sing. I'm bringing home a baby bumblebee. I'm sure a lot of you have heard that from your grandchildren or your children. Yes. This is my favorite bee, and there's two of them in this picture. Uh, these bees pollinate, you guessed it, squash. And it's kind of um, interesting. They're also ground nesters, so they don't live in a beehive. They actually build tunnels in the ground. Some of them go down more than a foot and lay their eggs. Um, if all the bees suddenly died for some catastrophe, we would not, we would only have seed for four years. And so that means that the pumpkin, the winter squash, the summer squash would all be in desperate straits right now. Of course, I know that some of you wouldn't feel too bad if we didn't have zucchini anymore. <laughs> but um, they do a big job in getting those squashes pollinated. mining bee, and I actually have a group of these bees living in my yard right now, and they've been there for a few years, so this is my favorite bee. I didn't know they were a bee. They are, um, they're called mining bees because they excavate nests in the ground, and they apply waterproofing and fungus-resistant linings to their root cells in their nests, and they come out in the early spring, and they just buzz around. When they first start, first a few of them appear, and you start seeing the little holes in the ground because they, they get sealed up over the winter. And then um, eventually, at this time now, my yard looks like it has a bunch of little tiny volcanoes in it. But, um, and they are often, they're kind of a metallic, they can be a, a metallic green to black. And so they are often mistaken for house flies. And that's what, I, in fact, I was told they were ground wasps, but then they were not, they are bees. And then the sweat bee, um, they got their name because sometimes they sip sweat from people. Uh, most species are pretty drab, and you wouldn't even notice them. Again, they're another one that's kind of got that metallic green. Um, some of them are really shimmering metallic green. And they are, sweat bees are some of the most common bees in Oregon croplands. And they're broad generalists. They visit many different plant groups. And some are partially social and nest in tunnels in the ground. And we have the longhorn bee, which you might notice pretty long antennas, so that's why it's called the longhorn bee. And they typically don't emerge until summer, and they're a little bit larger than honeybees. And there's about 25 different species of longhorn bees. And we have the leaf cutter bee, and unfortunately they don't have, they have really large mandibles, which you can't see in this picture, um, up front, so they use like scissors or pinchers to cut, the, actually cut the leaves. Um, they are, they have, 
They nest in cracks and crevices of wood or rock, in beetle holes, in pithy stems, and occasionally in the ground. And there's over 100 species of these in Oregon. Um, and they can cut a leaf piece in only a few seconds, so they're pretty fast workers. And then finally, today we have the mason bee, which is what um, we're talking about in the classes today. And mason bees get their name from using mud to create brood cells in their nest. They often also get mistaken for flies. So they range in color from metallic blue to green and occasionally black, and there's about 70 species. Um, and like honeybees, several species of mason bees are managed for agricultural production. But the mason bee is pretty different from the honeybee. Um, they're not as concerned about the loss of pollen. And if you've ever seen the 1970s show, The, the Odd Couple, where there was kind of two divorced men who are sharing an apartment and there's the sloppy roommate and the really um, neat roommate. So that's sort of like the honeybee and the, and the mason bee. So the um, honeybees are very precise and less pollen actually comes into direct contact with the blossoms that they pollinize. Um, so they're less efficient than mason bees. So mason bees tend to be more erratic about their flight patterns and they fly back and forth between trees Instead of pollen baskets, which the honeybees have, they, they kind of ni nicely package up all, the, all their pollen to take it back to the nest, a uh, hive. So the mason bees just kind of land on the flower and all the, the specialized hairs called scopa collect the pollen as they land. And then they lose a lot of it as they fly around, which is very good for pollinating. So it helps a lot um, for the plants. See, so they drop a lot more pollen along the way. So. So somehow, uh, honeybees that visited by a single honeybee can result in a successful transfer of pollen, only 5% of the blossoms. And mason bee does a lot better than that. So it's really good and very popular now for pollinating all kinds of plants in Oregon. So isn't that diversity amazing? So Eric Hallman wrote, the Earth is not merely an incubator for evolution. Rather, it's a complex and intelligently designed home that God has given humankind to care for and keep. The Earth is a magnificent creation, remembering that we are merely passing through on this Earth for our short lifetimes. We must be careful custodians for future generations. The Earth and its living creatures are works of God. So God created biodiversity for a reason. The honeybees, a race specifically pollinating crops, have declined due to parasitic mites, disease, and pesticides. Our wild pollinators are also disappearing at alarming rates due to habitat loss, pesticide poisoning, diseases, and pests. In addition, many of the wildflowers that pollinators feed on are rapidly disappearing. So, how can you help? You can grow a variety of bee-friendly flowers that bloom from spring through fall. Grow the flowers, shrubs, and trees that native pollinators feed on with overlapping bloom times to support pollinators spring through fall. Protect and provide bee nests and caterpillar host plants. A home for growing pollinators is essential. You can leave patches of bare ground and brush piles or install nesting blocks. We have one on the front altar here. Avoid using pesticides, especially insecticides. And talk to your neighbors about the importance of pollinators and their habitats. Spread the word. So, now we're going to ask you to fill out a pledge card. And on the end of each pew is a basket with some pieces of paper and a pen. So please take one and pass it down. If you don't have one, raise your hand. We will get you one. Um, take one. And then when you have it, and you'll find the words in your bulletin, but write, as my offering to the earth, I pledge, as my offering to the earth, I pledge. And choose one of these ways or another 
that you know of and fill in the end of that sentence. When you're done, turn to one of your neighbors in groups of two or three and talk about why you chose that way, that pledge. And preferably try to talk to somebody you didn't come with today. Last uh, <coughs> summer in July, on a really warm Sunday morning, uh, the Sunday school kids, uh, we had Sasha, John and Mary's uh, daughter, and um, uh, let's see, Abby and Zoe, um, Lu Louise's children, and then we had Ingrid, um, and that's uh, Lance and Sue, Rosalind's granddaughter and Luke and Cammie, oh, the whole family, and we made this. And I'm going to have to ask somebody if they could tip it up so you could see it. I'm terrified I'm going to drop it. We made a pollinator bowl, which also would be called a bird bath. And we put on um, our work gloves, and we designed this, and each child took a section and did their own design. I just love children's art. It, and so this has sat all summer because it had some leaking problems that were finally fixed. And we used the pattern of just a, a flower pot tray. And this is gonna go up in the meditation garden for the pollinators. And I'm sure the pollinators will share with the birds. And you children have to all help keep it filled because I think they'll drink a lot of water out of it. And so if you're with your parents' permission, you can go up there with a can of water and fill this up in the meditation garden. So we're going to bless the pollinator bowl, and then we'll bless you all for church school as well. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the chance to be part of your creation and to be entrusted to help care for your creation. We thank you for this pollinator bowl, for the hands that have made it and those that will tend to it. And we pray that it will provide water for birds and pollinators and whatever other creatures need it. And gracious God, we thank you for the children of the church. We thank you uh, for their appreciation of nature, for the ways they help us to slow down and see the world around us. And just be with them today as they learn more about your creation and as they uh, just teach us more about you and your creation. We pray this in your name, O Christ. Amen.